some of you, some of you may have been here for yesterday's discussion, and there will be some of the, some overlap. But what the, the program for today is the the theme is really to talk to people who were around at the time of the original, you know, the original architects that we're looking at or working, but were, for the most part, it's not in, in, uh, entirely consistent, but were, for the most part were of the generation immediately, you know, may have been, might have been students in some cases, um, collaborators, but people that were in the circle of the, the, the work we're looking at, but who also we feel may have something to say about tying the work of 1979 to today. I mean, that's really the big question that we've been asking the whole time. You know, why are we looking at this stuff? You know, what's beyond the merits of the work itself? Why, why look at this 1979 moment right now? Beyond just the historical interest. So we divided the day into two sessions. The first session will be on, um, as you can see, media and the globalization of LA architecture. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And then in the afternoon, we'll talk more specifically about drawing. So I'll moderate this session. Todd is going to moderate the afternoon session. And that'll start, um, do we have an exact time? 1.30. Uh, um, so there'll be enough time to go and take a, a, a proper lunch break. Um, all right, so I think before introducing the panelists, I, uh, I'd like to go through a few images just to, to set the, the lay of the land. I mean, one of the really striking things about the moment in LA architecture that we're looking at is that LA goes from being, and you know, we talked a bit about this yesterday, it goes from being a, 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 essentially a, a kind of um, wilderness to in, instant kind of global recognition. And of a kind that was not equivalent to, let's say, the coverage that the case study program got, things like that. There was, a, there was a, a, I think, a, a qualitative uh, change in the, the view of LA from outside. Um, when you know, Foster and Rogers went to LA in the mid-60s when they finished at Yale, I mean, Rogers' account of it is as a kind of uh, journey into the wilderness, you know, and they kind of come back with these discoveries, right, like Soriano or or all of the oil refineries that people like Bannum are looking. This is a little bit before Bannum, too. So within 10 years, 12 years, there's, there's you know, the stuff, you know, some of the, some of the um, material I'll show you now is within 12 years of Foster and Rogers making this kind of trip out into the, the, the wilderness of the West Coast. So one of the characters that is very important in this whole story is John Dreyfus, the LA Times critic. Um, I won't go into these in detail. He covered each of the shows. Um, we've reprinted all of his essays, all of his uh, pieces from the LA Times in the catalog. So those are all there. And you know, he was key. One of the key things about Dreyfus was, you know, here was somebody with interests in, you know, really, to be honest, the kind of marginal aspects of LA architectural culture, talking about them in, a, in, in absolutely in the mainstream press and on the front page of the art section, right? So this is a kind of, this is the interesting thing, I mean, to me about Dreyfus is that, that, that uh, paradox, right? So Dreyfus was a kind of critic, very vocal critic of LA corporate architectural culture. Um, and we can debate whether that was a valid criticism or not, but, um, but bringing this this interest in, in what's happening in these little uh, hidden away places and these experiments to the front page of the LA Times. The LA Times also sent f photographers, right? So a lot of the photographs uh, that we, we, we've shown in the catalog, and you can see them upstairs, are by Mary Frampton, who's the LA Times photographer. And um, anyway, you can see that. So it's a visual and written documentation. Uh, Giovannini wrote in the, in the uh, Herald Examiner, right, this was a little less systematic, this was more of a, a kind of one-off review. So there was a discussion locally, of course, I mean, this was a significant event locally. But really, the, the interesting thing, I think, is, when, is, is that when it becomes more of a global discussion. So, um, 78, this is the year before the exhibition we're looking at, uh, issue of A plus U with Michael Ross's piece, 
um, young Los Angeles and possibly postmodern architects. Now he cast the net pretty wide. Most of everybody we're, we are looking at were in this survey, um, but he also includes other you know, Schulitz and people that were a little bit outside of this core group. Now, you know, Ross, one of the interesting things about his piece, and I think this is typical of a lot of the writing about LA architecture at that time, was that the one of the tropes that emerges is the kind of survey, right? So we talked yesterday a little bit about the absence of a movement, right, a kind of coherent, you know, there wasn't the, the New York Five or, the, you know, the whites or the grays, right? I mean, there was the, the LA ar architectural culture resisted to some extent those categories. And Ross talks about that and he says, you know, this article is not about any group of architects who have anything in particular in common with each other. It is instead a survey of what some young Los Angeles architects are up to and which we hope you will find of interest. Right, so this trope of the kind of survey, the kind of neutral, here's, here's what's happening, right? And that comes up several times, um, not least in Tom's own uh, poster for the lecture series, right? So there's a kind of, well, we're not gonna, we're not gonna name name, we're not gonna create <clears throat> any kind of uh, periodization or, or categories. We are simply gonna tell you what's happening. Right, and that becomes one of the voices, um, one of the modes by which LA architecture seems to me to be discussed at that time. So there's Ross's piece in A plus U. There's a well-known, you know, most of you have probably seen these images uh, from Domus 1980. Again, the only a partially overlapping set. Um, Gary on the cover, but really a survey of, of most of the group that we're looking at here. So this is Boissier's. Uh, article in Domus, and again, there's, it's, it's in the format of a survey, right, a kind of pay, one page per architect, or page spread, I think. Uh, the book California Counterpoint, right, Institute of Architecture and Urban Studies, that was 82, um, so the subtitle New West Coast Architecture, I'm not gonna go into this, but, so there's a kind of flurry of, of interest in the press, uh, in the architectural press on the, in this area. Uh, Peter Cook writes in the in the first issue of AA Files, right? Los Angeles comes of age, right? So there's this kind of claim of a of a, a, a legitimate a, a kind of moment of legitimacy. And then a very important thing, which I think we'll talk about more this afternoon, if I'm not mistaken, which is the PA Awards program, and that was absolutely key. You'll see some of the work that we have in the exhibition was prepared explicitly for the PA Awards. I'm in particular. Uh, Craig and Roberts um, folio for the Southside Settlement, right? So that's an interesting to look at to, to see what you know what a PA award package looked like. I mean, this is a really significant um, significant program. One of the other so that's in the in the print press. One of the other threads is uh, and we have um, Kevin McMahon wrote a, a, a very interesting essay in the catalog on. That, that put this into pers the historical perspective, which is you know, videotaping, closed circuit television. Um, the lectures, right, so as most of you might know, there was a, a lecture and the, the exhibition, these, this was a series of weekly exhibitions that Tom ran, then there was a lecture each week. The lectures were recorded and then, in a sense, fed back, so to speak, through into the exhibition, right? And so there was a kind of closed, closed circuit, kind of recursive, um, description of the lecture within the exhibition and vice versa. Um, so this is Roland Coates' piece, one of the LA Times photographs. So again, I, I encourage you to read Kevin's piece because it does, you know, the closed circuit, uh, uh, in, in this case, black and white video videotape um, is a kind of new medium. There's also, you know, this is a little bit uh, admittedly unsystematic, but I think there's, you know, the film film about architecture or by architects about architecture seems to kind of pop up now. So the Eames, of course, were doing those, making films since the 50s, but in 77, their best known, you know, the Powers of Ten, right, which is probably the best known piece, um, is they released that. Bannum was documenting the city through film. People like William White, it's not LA, but New York, but still there's a, this, the film becomes uh, important. So you'll see, in, if you go to the upstairs gallery, um, the, uh, Jesse Alexander's descriptive film documentation of the house and the whole construction process. And that, that was of uh, one of Roland Coates' houses. So I think, you know, the ta tacit in all of this is the, the question of, 
uh, self-publishing now, I think, and that may, be, may or may not be something we want to address. Um, right, so we're now about 15 years out from the first, well, are we, 98? I believe uh, our Connect started in 98, Blogger 99, right? That's really self-publishing becomes possible um, widely. So that means, you know, we're already a decade and a half out from that moment. Um, so I think there's a question about what's the role of self-publishing in this too. And a lot of this work that we're looking, I was, you know, some of the work I was showing was, was more conventional journalism, but there's also the question of self-publishing, um, which some of the films clearly were. And then, of course, you know, recent, recent interest in zine culture, right? So, or, or small pamphlets, right? The Clip Stamp Fold exhibition, that's already uh, eight, seven years ago, I think. And then um, recently, the Arcazines show that was traveling around. So that's another kind of axis in this uh, conversation. So um, let me introduce the panelists, and then I think we'll keep it I mean, I have some questions, but I think if there's, if, if anybody has something they want to say right off, I think we should just launch right in. I mean, I, I my questions are not fairly general, so we can, I think, start the discussion if we want. So let me go through and introduce everybody here. So first, on my left, Ming Feng, whom presumably a lot of you already know. Ming Feng has been committed to architectural education for nearly 30 years. After serving as SciArc's Director of Graduate Programs for eight years, she was appointed Director of Academic Affairs in 2010 and is currently the President-elect of the ACSA. She is Principal and Director of Design for the internationally renowned Los Angeles-based firm Hodgetts & Fung, which has received numerous prestigious awards, including the Fellowship Architecture Award, the Gold Medal from the AIALA, the AIACC Firm of the Year, and the GSA Design Excellence Award, and most recently, um, the R&D Award from Architect Magazine for their roof, fiberglass roof for the LAUSD Modular Classroom Project. Next to her, Paul Goldberger. Uh, he is a leading figure in architectural criticism. He began his career at the New York Times, where in 1984, his architecture criticism was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Distinguished Criticism, the highest award in journalism. From 97 through 2011, he served as the architecture critic for The New Yorker and is currently a contributing editor at Vanity Fair. He also holds the Joseph Urban Chair in Design and Architecture at the New School in New York City and was formerly dean of the Parsons School of Design. He's the author of several, book, several books, most recently, Why Architecture Matters, and is currently working on a full-length biography of Frank Gehry. Next to him, Nick Syrup is a principal and design director for the LA office of Perkins and Will. He is also an early alumnus from the Southern California Institute of Architecture, where he studied with Ray Cappy, Roland Cote, Tom Main, Jim Stafford, and with Eric Moss, in whose office he worked for eight years, starting in 79. A fellow in the AIA and, at Sci and, and a SciArc Distinguished Alumnus, Nick has taught at SciArc, USC, UCLA, and Woodbury. His design work with Perkins and Will has been recognized with over 50, 75 awards, including 50 from the AIA. On my far right, Barbara Bester. Barbara is principal of Bester Architecture, which she launched in 1995. She was the founding chair of the graduate program at the Woodbury University School of Architecture and is currently the executive director of the university's Julius Shulman Institute. She's the author of the 2006 book, Bohemian Modernism, Modern, Living in Silver Lake, which explored the informal and eccentric modernism found in Silver Lake's rich domestic architectural history. Her firm is currently designing new headquarters for the LA companies Beats by Dre and Nasty Gal, an innovative small lot housing complex in Echo Park, and the Sisters of Los Angeles line of design objects. Her work will, will be featured in the new sculpturalism show, which opens next Saturday. That's next Saturday, right? I, think, yeah. I hope so. Uh, on my right, Mark Mack. Mar uh, Mark has been an architect in California for 30 years. Before opening an office with Andrew Beatty in 1978, he worked for Hans Holein in Vienna and Haas Roker and Emilia Ambaz in New York. In 93, he moved to San Francisco-based office to Venice, Venice, California. Mark's typological approach to design is informed by his academic practice. Before moving to LA, he was professor of architecture at Berkeley and, has since, uh, and since 1993 has been professor of architecture at UCLA. He has also been a visiting faculty member at Harvard, Rice, Chicago, and SciArc. In the late 70s, he was uh, also founding editor of Archetype Magazine, a publication dedicated, I believe I'm quoting the editors here, dedicated to a mix of scholarship, relevance, novelty, and beauty. So that's, that was 
Mark was kind enough to bring one of these by. So if anybody wants to have a look at that after, it's in here. So does anybody have any reflection, any thoughts on what we've already talked about, or do you, I mean, I'm happy well, to start uh, unless you want to. Yeah, just uh, maybe a little history uh, since it's still fresh. Um, when I came to uh, California in 78, uh, uh, there was already uh, sort of a, a trend uh, brewing, uh, definitely in New York, with the Institute of Architecture and Urban Design, Peter Eisenman and Philip Johnson's vehicle. And also there was Andrew McNair uh, at that institution who brought out Skyline Magazine, which was, I think, to my knowledge, the first sort of uh, newspaper-like publication for architecture in a sort of larger 11 by 17 uh, format. And this was uh, essentially our impulse when I came to San Francisco through certain uh, circumstantial uh, movements. Uh, I originally, I wanted to be uh, come to Los Angeles and be an architect for rock and roll musicians. Uh, but that didn't work out, so I ran out of money and ended up in San Francisco where my girlfriend was. Um, but then in San Francisco, there, uh, there were, at the same time, Bill Stout just opened his bookstore and Stephen Hall was working for Bill Stout in the bookstore as a bookseller while he was working also for Lawrence Halprin's office. And we were kind of getting, kind of hanging out in Bill Stout's house because there was no bookstore yet and uh, talked about uh, self-promotion essentially because the big, we were far away from having built anything, but uh, each of us, uh, Stephen was at the AA, uh, I came from Austria via New York. There were, uh, we wanted to create something on the, uh, on the West Coast because we felt even more isolated in San Francisco than uh, in Los Angeles. So, we started Pamphlet Architecture, which was one of the first uh, essentially self-promoting uh, works of architecture publication, which used uh, one architect, one project, uh, and through the means of, uh, of offset printing and labor, which we did ourselves, we were managing to get it out, and it became kind of a, a discussion point. And it's still going, uh, as, uh, 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 but it was later bought by Princeton, or taken over by Princeton Press. And that, to me, was kind of a beginning of a self-organizing uh, uh, of architect uh, ideas, not depending on architect Progressive Architecture or Architecture Plus, which were the magazines at that at that point. Uh, so uh, Stephen did the first pamphlet one. I did the second, and I think it was Leib Woods came in. Uh, there were uh, sort of the usual suspects from that period doing these uh, things. And um, in uh, 1970. Seven or yeah, seventy-seven, eight. Uh, we started actually a a group or a event in San Francisco in a, a coffee house it was called Western Edition, and it was a idea of presenting architecture uh, in a more academic fashion than just talking about your your work. The only the, the only sort of restriction was that you couldn't talk about your own work. You had to present something which was outside your own realm, like uh, something you were interested. I was doing research on nudism at nudist camps at that point, so that was an interesting topic to me, like how 
uh, architecture gets affected if people are naked. Uh, so <laughs> there was very little finding on that end. <laughs> uh, but then. Uh, <laughs> Did you publish uh, a book, Mark? Hmm? That, that would have been a good subject for pamphlet architecture, yes, I think, yeah, to publish mine, it, actually. Uh, mine was actually with a project I did earlier. It was called Ten Californian Houses. It was about sort of the idea of, of, uh, of architecture in context. Uh, um, but uh, at this, uh, at this, this uh, Western edition, uh, I mean, we had like people like Kurt Forster who was teaching at uh, at uh, <clears throat> Stanford at the time, Diane Girardo, uh, and even the only one who got really a very negative reception was Thomas Gordon Smith, the sort of the king of postmodernism, who talked about his own work. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, but then it got so popular in the coffee house that we m had to move uh, to the Art Institute. And there we, st we started to stage these uh, uh, double lectures, one architect from San Francisco and one from uh, Los Angeles. And we had these twin lectures going on, which was, uh, again, Tom came up. I think he was paired with Stanley Seidowitz. So there was very kind of lively discussion, out of which came the desire to to expand, archi like a, create a, a magazine which we called Archetype, and again was done on a shoestring uh, in the back of our office, trying to sell ads and subscriptions, and um, it. Um, it was at that time that uh, I felt that actually we in San Francisco had more knowledge of what was going on in Los Angeles than people in Los Angeles themselves, because there was this kind of short uh, Southwest, or it was called even a different airline, where you could go for $17. PSA. Up. PSA, yes. PSA, PSA. Yeah, PSA. Yeah. And it was like a very easy, yep. easy commute. Uh, and so we, we felt we had actually, through these uh, individual invitations, like one, you know, uh, one evening it was uh, Robert and Craig, or Tom and uh, Michael, or Coy. Uh, so they would tell us about how interesting or not interesting the other people were. So we were, like, there was a kind of a gossip line going, and we, we became this sort of um, maybe more uh, a medium, in, in, if, if you want to see, uh, in that sense. So we had a lot of information, and, uh, and I think we, we were one of the first ones to publish Frank Gehry's house. And By we, you mean archetype? Archetype, yes. So do you have a sense of who the readers, I mean, you presumably do if you guys were filling out mailing labels. So w what was the uh, readership of archetype? Where was it? All over. I think we had, of course, more, San Francisco, more California, but mm -hmm. we had about, at one time, about 900 subscribers. And it was pretty much going all over, and some uh, some libraries, European and, uh, things like that. So it was, but it never really, you know, it never got to a point where we could actually say we could have an administration taking over, making the the, the printing. Mm -hmm. So it's always we can just ran out of energy because we always had to put a lot of work in, mm -hmm. into it. Um, actually, it's um, so maybe something that I wanted to ask you, um, Mark. Um, there is a sense in, in this exhibit about California being Los Angeles and Southern California, and you, you were talking about California, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. And there was a, there, there is a perception that also may be a reality that North and South, North California and Southern California architecture are very different, even though it is California. And well, I think, that, when, yes. and then so when you were covering this, you already are touching upon some differences and the dialogue between the two uh, different areas, yeah. right? Well, I think it was the first time where there, 
a younger generation was more connective because the Northern California with Worcester and uh, Vernon de Mars and this whole kind of Bay Area school was very um, uh, wed to the sort of Northern California sensitivities about San Francisco as an urban center, the landscape as a, as a regional uh, 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 element and so they were very uh, dominated by uh, 60s or 70s uh, ideas about planning and architecture coming from a uh, sort of more humanistic uh, uh, quality rather than individual architectural achievements and Escherich uh, uh, did very I mean at that that point uh, uh, you see, you you see, uh, Berkeley was really the generator of all of these uh, ideas, and the planning department kind of dominated and, and architecture to dominate the discussion and the idea values of that period. And we felt we didn't have to be historically true to that sensitivity, and were much more outreaching uh, towards uh, Los Angeles. I mean, I, I, I find that uh, we were talking about, you know, I'm going to use the word vernacular for, for a moment, because last, yesterday, um, during the, the, the discussion in the panel with, with, with Kipnis, the, um, um, at, one, at one time everybody was talking about the building and how do you build in Los Angeles, and that you're using uh, cheap material, you know, stucco, type five, wood framing, and then to a certain extent, it established a, a California style. And to a certain extent, it also established a style which is very not international, different from the case study. Uh, um, Non-European. Um, and, and I think that's probably something that, you know, I like to, to, to talk about, which, um, which endemically is very, very LA based, you know, starting with, even you mentioned the Eames when they came out to Los Angeles, and they, you know, they basically uh, stay in a neutral house and build a Kazam machine and, 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 and start everything from scratch, which is this kind of garage industry of using raw material, accessible material to build and to experiment, you know, to fabricate and to build. So we go either from furniture design or to architecture. And I think there is that kind of sensibility uh, and added to it too is being able to pick up and do something with your own hand, which I think is really different from uh, either the East Coast or especially or even in, in, in Europe because you don't have that type of construction. So, so, I, so I think I like the fact that you know, because I was very aware of the difference between North and South and the, and, and, and the Northern region have this kind of, a, it's still ecologically right, you know, um, being humanist and, and, and using wood, but using wood in a very, very different way than Southern California. So I, 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 I think there clearly is that sense of why the media would be attracted to, uh, uh, to Los Angeles uh, from that point of view. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. that's an interesting point because the, the really, there, there, you know, you're, when you talk about a journal like Archetype, I mean, that's, you said, you know, art, the, the rule of Proof Pamphlet was that, you know, you had to write about somebody else. So this is a kind of, um, you know, I guess they think about the distinction between, let's say, self-published media and people writing about your work. I mean, really, there's not a lot of, I think, I think this is right, <laughs> self-publishing that comes out of this group of architects, really. I mean, in the sense of this, this kind of write, doing a lot of writing about your work. Um, was there something about the work itself that lent itself to this sudden, uh, didn't make it sort of mediagenic, but that it was a sort of, um, 
uh, lent itself to this this uptake, you know. Very yeah, I, I think there very much was. If I can go back to what Ming said just a moment ago, uh, I mean, looking looking from the east, uh, there was a very great distinction between northern and southern California. Um, I think they really were, and and to a very large extent, still are completely separate cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, I always thought of Mark as kind of an outlier, <laughs> as opposed to. Uh, representing a change in San Francisco that you were just sort of a, a, a disconnected part of the Los Angeles culture yeah, who, who happened to have been there, that's all. Yeah. Um, but uh, from the East, it was Los Angeles that seemed fresh and different and creative. I mean, this was where things were happening that had not happened before anywhere else. And that's one reason I just started paying a lot of attention to it in, in those years from the East. Uh, it was, uh, it felt exotic almost. Exotic and different and exciting and it was cheaper to come here than Europe and there wasn't all that much going on in Europe anyway and so I started coming here a lot in those years and, and uh, the very culture you began to describe and that we've been talking about had no real equivalent in the East uh, it had no real equivalent in Northern California. I think the, the Bay Region, in a way, always looked more, to the extent that it got beyond the Bay Region, it looked more to the Northwest, to Seattle and Portland. Mm -hmm. Its connections were there more than to uh, southern, to, southward to Los Angeles, I think. So, um, uh, and that seemed, at least from the vantage point of looking from the East, fundamentally it evolved somewhat, but it was fundamentally unchanged for a number of years. So there was nothing in the 70s that was new and different about it the way there was. And it, you had a sense in Los, that Los Angeles was awakening from a long period of hibernation almost. You know, there, there was sort of uh, <coughs> all of the modernists who in fact were well known. It's not as though nothing had ever happened. I mean, the, the whole world had heard of Neutra and he was almost as good as right at self-publicizing. <laughs> and, you know, that, the whole school of you know, uh, California architects in that generation did have a certain amount of national and international renown, but there was a sense from, at least from outside, that everything had kind of gone to sleep for a while. And it began, and it was the sense of it awakening in the 70s with new stuff that got everybody interested. Well, also, I think uh, it, nothing grows out of nothing. Right. You know, uh, like what we did in San Francisco, we were looking at Maybach, for instance, mm -hmm. as an innovator. Yes. Not as a formal vehicle, but more right. what he did with materiality. Right. And, uh, and also uh, even going back, getting interested in Julia Morgan and mm -hmm. uh, Coxhead, these things were, nobody was talking about these people uh, right. at that time because it, the Although I think it was also, was you're absolutely right, stuff. but it was also a time when sort of everybody was looking back at all kinds of stuff that had been disdained for a long yeah, time and yeah. had, had, I mean, in the East there was an equivalent thing where, where all the eclectics, like, you know, Cass Gilbert and James Gamble Rogers and, and Stanford White and all those people who had been sort of cast aside by modernist history were being rediscovered. Some of that led into postmodernism. Some of it was just uh, uh, more productive than that yeah. <laughs> or, or just more academic. But nevertheless, in one way or another, all this stuff was just kind of coming out. Well, here in LA, I had always had the feeling that there was this history of artists who were building, mm -hmm. uh, like Ferris Gallery and uh, all these things which were going on at that time, the Venice kind of culture were, and I was kind of first made aware of by another magazine called Wet, the magazine of gourmet bathing, yeah. which introduced a lot of architecture and crossover uh, architecture art, uh, and artists, artists who built their own lofts with cheap materials and filled, you know, uh, made pools out of mechanical pits and things like that. So there was an incredible, uh, I think LA more so, 
even though in San Francisco there were crazy things going on, survival, laboratory of survival, what was that? Research. Research. And then you guys, when Wes Jones was doing, you know, the, uh, with Holt, Fow, and Jones. I mean, there were always uh, module things like uh, going on at the same time. Uh, and I thought we were looking from, New York, uh, from San Francisco to more to Irving Gill and rediscovered mm -hmm. Schindler and uh, right. at Neutra became kind of, oh, you know, Neutra, you right. know, he right, just right, did right. stuff. Uh, so it, it was a very interesting time of discovery and, and, and postmodernism was a kind of vehicle to allowing that, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. so much dogmatically uh, categorizing. Uh, and some of us, you know, we tried to uh, resist somehow the, the kind of urge of, of just doing historic architecture right. by cladding, cl or cladding it in somehow fundamental research in what are the, the basic elements of architecture. Uh, I wanted to, to, to sort of speak to the sort of shock of the new of California from an East Coast perspective in the maybe early 80s, which I was, I was telling Mark earlier that perhaps for me the first exposure to anything about California was a show at the ICA in Boston, which was, it just featured Frank Gehry's house from 79 and then the work of uh, Mark Mack's office, which were two very different, you know, kinds of projects when I think uh, Mark's kind of color, colorful uh, house studies and, and Gehry's much more radical house, but from the, from the position of a kind of architecture fan, I think I was in high school actually, but at, at that time was it was that this was so different from anything from like the 10, you know, the white architecture movement, which I'd sort of become familiar with, or perhaps the more prevalent by then kind of conservatism of, of Boston and New York that, you know, everything was clad in brick and everything was, you know, people are talking about the French hotel plan as the, as the thing to look at in the future. So this was really, it seemed like it was from outer space at the time. And I, I imagine that that was maybe the case in other other places. One one thing I was thinking about last night about this panel was um, the kind of reverse dissemination of information of, of images from the West Coast outwards. And if you look at something like the Herzog and Demeron photo studio in, in Basel, the you know clad in the in, in bitumen roofing, that's that's sort of 19 I think 80 81. Obviously totally influenced by Gary and, and you know leading to this other kind of seed of, of you know what you might call powerhouse kind of global architecture behemoth. But I, I, I think that it brings up this issue of you know is, is it style? Is it maybe the kind of concept of using the banal to make something completely different to kind of as a way of a break from the past? I think that's very... Yeah. I mean, that certainly for looking at the LA work from outside, it wasn't, you know, the, some of the stuff that Mark, you were referring to in the back, you know, the backstory, right, with the art, the, the Venice artists and things like that, that wasn't part of the how that work was consumed from outside. For me, in my circles anyway, it was just, you consumed it as a kind of, you know, that may have synthesized this kind of work, but ultimately what you got were the images. You knew very little about the working methods, you know, these kind of more intimate um, stories of the kind, you know, the sort of laboratories of experimentation. I mean, from my perspective, it was, you know, the work, it was the work you were, you were, you were receiving very directly. And I think there was a kind of, um, yeah, I mean, the question of style is a big one, I think, because you, you in the absence of a self-declared movement, right, like a, a self-defined kind of uh, uh, collective identity, you know, the question, other questions come up. I mean, because the, the style being one of them, right, because the, the you know, it was, it was critical, I mean, I think it was critical that the LA work had enough coherence, like just enough coherence to to stick, right? To kind mm -hmm. of be, be picked up, but enough incoherence to, to promote the myth of kind of experimentation and, and well, newness, right? I mean, you, there was you, because, you, because you were bringing the fact that it was a raw city, right? right. I mean, it was very raw. I mean, it, Venice at that time was this kind of no man's land. Uh, it's not the Venice that that you know now, which is completely gentrified. So, so there, 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 there is this really a kind of a weird sense that I would imagine that when people would come out to LA to visit Los Angeles, and visit some of those guys' studio out on the uh, in the Venice Beach, 
uh, that they would be shocked by the way the studio were run. It's just this kind of open-ended garage industry, really. And and but but I think I think what really kind of distinguished the work has more to do with the scale of the work as well. And because at that time, a lot of things were being built in LA. I mean, you have a lot of kind of small house, small addition. That opportunity that the architect had at the time to do small scale project, which I don't think you have too many of that in the East Coast. I mean, it was. You know, well, I, I don't. I don't agree with that, though, Ming. Because uh, I mean, if you, let, let's go back. People have referred to the Whites before. I mean, Five yeah. Architects. The that book. Uh, was mostly small-scale stuff. Michael Graves had not done anything but additions to people's mm -hmm. houses by then. Um, and in fact, that was also an act of self-publishing. You know, they put that book together, they mm -hmm. uh, created their own sort of, in effect, coalition and uh, had it published through George Wittenborn, who was a bookseller, basically. It was like the East Coast William Stout. And uh, uh, eventually, when it turned into something more than people had expected, it was republished by Oxford and became a sort of real book book. But it was initially a kind of small uh, self-publication through Wittenborn. Uh, so there was, in that sense, a sort of, and, and there was also, mm -hmm. as uh, we, we're certainly not here to talk about them, but there were as many things separating them as joining them. And their, their work, even then, was more different than the book wanted you to think, because it wanted to, sort of sell the coherence of a group. And I think there are some analogies mm -hmm. here because, mm -hmm. uh, again, you know, as, as, uh, as you just said, it was sort of, there was enough in common so that you could create the image of a school or a style. But in fact, once you look beyond the surface, they were in fact very, very different. But I mean, the question of, of, of scale, I mean, maybe one thing you mentioned, the, the context of Venice then, what, I mean, thinking about five architects, I mean, mm -hmm. site is, fairly in, in a lot of those projects is is indiscernible, right? right. And no, I'm the, not comparing the architecture itself, right. just the circumstances, let's say the uh, sociological and media related circumstances of it. The architecture itself obviously is completely different. But I mean the image of the small Venice alley house in this kind of sea of garages is a very powerful, yes, it's a very powerful absolutely. image, right? And that, that totally. doesn't happen with the other guys, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think from the eyes of a, someone who was a student in that period of time, the world looked very different. Mm -hmm. And uh, being a student at SciArc in the late 70s, we were reading about the five New York architects. We were reading about uh, postmodernism, which was all the rage, Michael Graves' Prismacolor drawings. And we were looking at still the modern masters. Um, but at the same time, Eric was teaching a class, a theory class, that was called The Twilight of the Idols, mm -hmm. and talking about how that work was no longer relevant, how we had to chart a new course. And there would be people speaking on the Wednesday evening speaker series, and I distinctly remember a talk that Coy Howard gave in particular where he read a poem called Ode to Pico Boulevard and showed images from one end of Pico Boulevard at the beach to downtown and talked about it not in the terms of this is urban blight, but in the terms of this is stunningly beautiful. And this is what this group of architects needs to celebrate. And working in Eric's office uh, in the, the late 70s. And I think it's interesting, too, that I, I read a quip in the book that Tom put this lecture series together in the summer of 79 while Ray was on sabbatical. I was with, with Ray on that sabbatical. Uh, it was actually the summer semester spent in, in Italy. But um, the work that Eric was doing, that Tom and Michael were doing, that Fred was doing, was picking up on this, the beauty of what they saw on Pico Boulevard, the plywood, the chain link, the asphalt, and a definite push against mm -hmm. the, the clarity and whiteness of what was coming oh, out absolutely. of New York. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I, let me say again, I was certainly not in any way comparing the architecture itself. 
only the circumstances by which the group came together and promoted itself. That, that, that's all. I think um, what's interesting in terms of what you're saying, Nick, is also if, if you look at Danziger's studio, that's 1965. So in, in a way, there is this kind of unspoken gestation period over about a decade and a half before we get to this 78 kind of heyday, which which maybe helps explain like you know sort of what's going on when you describe what's going on in SciArc, that there's a kind of a churning through this this alternative language formation you know, that, that that I guess mm -hmm. is a, a lot of the projects that we see in the publications from 78. You know, it, it sort of takes about 12 to 15 years to actually get a body of work out that then can go out and become publicly disseminated. But arguably, it's an it's an idea that started, you know, at least like by 1970. But even by the, the British interpretation of LA from 1972, it's kind of not. We're not that far off 10 years later in terms of how it gets disseminated. And and there'd also been Ed Ruscha's books, you know, the Sunset Strip and the Parking Lots and and all that stuff by then. Well, also, I think to me, LA always resisted some kind of like a, a movement where more than one comes together. Like mm -hmm. the one was the, or the, the idea of being one off or being an individual uh, was much more, to me at least, uh, uh, dominant or important than banding together and creating a movement. Uh, the movement may have been unconscious or using different ideas, but there was a brief period where Barton Myers tried to create the Silvers mm, uh, uh, yeah, with Tim right. Freeland, and this was mm. kind of like, so what? You know, it was not sticking at all. And uh, I, right. to me, LA was always this sort of, even the people we are talking about, they were kind of, uh, uneasy about being in th in that group. They were like, you know, at least to me in San Francisco, they were always gossiping about each other and it like how bad or good they are or that like, this is shit. Or, it was, it reminded me a little bit uh, more of my Viennese upbringing where everything except you uh, is bad. Uh, uh, so uh, a very egocentric, uh, uh, sort of idea of architectural, you know, existence, and so I, to me, it was very uh, sort of almost like home coming to LA, where San Francisco was so sane and so considerate and so nice in a way. But at the same time, like when Stephen Hall uh, was at Bill Stout's bookstore, he was always insisting that he has to go to New York to make it as an architect. Mm -hmm. Because all the publishing world is there, we gotta connect to them, we have to be at the source, it's a dead end here. And you know, he eventually went there and for a long time did not make it very, uh, he needed a long time to sort of hook up with that. But it, you know, all the mainstream publication things were, except for the uh, PA awards, featuring mostly Eastern architecture and European architecture examples. Where the, well, the American magazines, which at that time were Progressive Architecture, Architectural Record, and I think the AIA Journal. But, and all of those, by the way, were sitting on the desks of all of our studios, as well as Architectura, Domus, Arbitari, Ajardui, Japan Architect, A plus U. I mean, I think that's a critical difference between the, the studio then and the studio now, that students and people working in offices were immersed in that, that kind of media. And I don't know if anybody reads that kind of media any longer. It's all, it's all digital now. It's all instantly available in, in layered depth, far beyond what we had access to at that time. But I think everybody was watching what was going on around the world. and for a variety of reasons, there was a media spotlight starting to hone in on Los Angeles. And a lot of it, uh, you were talking about the architectural press, but a lot of it, a certain amount of it involved the general press as well. And I think that was key in terms of connecting it to the broader culture and making it more than just architects talking to each other. Uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, we saw the uh, John Dreyfus pieces earlier in there in the book, um, if anything, it seems as if media has changed more than architecture since then because it's, now, it's sort of incomprehensible 
that a major national newspaper would assign a major writer to cover a series of small exhibitions and talks given by a group of unknown architects uh, week after week after week. Um, similarly, you know, I, I published, I think I, I published the Ron Davis House in the New York Times Sunday Magazine in 76, um, which was the first time uh, anything by Frank Gehry had been published in a national non-architectural publication. And then his own house a couple years later and, and lots of other stuff. And uh, the Roland Coat House, a whole bunch of them actually, now that I look back at them, um, that I don't think you, you, you couldn't pay the editors of the New York Times enough to get them to give that kind of space today to uh, architecture of that sort, or that was by people who were not well known. Well, why, why, why do you think I, th I think I think a lot of this has to do with not changes in architecture, but changes in journalism and the fact that you know, newspapers were once powerful, mighty, and gargantuan and had endless appetite for space to fill. And people had no other way of getting all this than through newspapers and magazines. And again, we're talking about the non-architectural press, the general media here. And uh, I mean, anyone, I don't know if anyone here remembers, but it used to be, you know, the LA Times every day was this thick thing that, that you had to lug, uh, or the Sunday New York Times, the same thing. I mean, they were gargantuan, enormous, heavy, uh, overstuffed objects. And uh, they had so much advertising that they needed to have so many pages so that there was at least some proportional rep relationship between the two. And so, you know, the editors of the New York Times were just desperate for, they would always want more and more and more. Uh, I remember thinking that in the years I was a writer there, being a writer, if you were a good writer who had a good, a, reputation and did decent stuff, it was totally a seller's market. You could just, anything you wanted to write, they would happily publish. And, you know, then I went to the New Yorker and discovered it was a buyer's market. The editors actually would decide what would get published, and there was a much, much more limited, narrower uh, window. Now, uh, and the world of journalism has changed dramatically. The, the, the compensating fact is the presence of uh, digital media and everything we've been talking about and that everybody knows about. Uh, so in the one sense, everything is instantly publishable and instantly available and, we can, and everybody in the world has all this information at the touch of a finger. In another way though, nothing sort of rises above and gets noticed in quite the same way that uh, Frank Gehry's Ron Davis House got noticed when it was in the, in the New York Times Magazine in 1976 or John Dreyfus's pieces made the gallery shows really things that people talked about. Or even like Domus, who does, a, mm -hmm. it was very edited. I mean, there were actually conscious efforts to create content. Mm -hmm. And it, it had to be not just one like blip here and there, but like Domus would send out an editor or Barbara Goldstein was working with them. As a as a correspondence, and they would do a California issue, right, right, or right, they right. would uh, at, essentially create a topic, and that would could lead to a movement or kind of collectivize the sort of idea. And so the ideas became stronger because they were edited. They were kind of uh, sort mm -hmm. of controlled in yes. in a sense. Uh, and so the focus toward that. Uh, is maybe much stronger than it is now. I think it's right, because journalism once represented had a kind of authority. In other words, the, 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 the people were being told this has all been assembled for you by somebody who knows what they're talking about, so take it seriously. Yeah. Um, that and then there was they, the counter push right. who was not included. Right, it right, right, generated right. another sort of article or something like that. So it kind of was was in this ping pong. Main, uh, but that's inter I mean, the interest. That's a kind of interesting symbiosis, right? Because you know, for an architecture that's a kind of uh, experimental, marginal, uh, needed that. I mean, by implication, then needed that kind of a legitimate. Uh, 
form of institutional publish, publishing institutions, right? To kind of so, in other words, it's, it's an iron think that yeah, 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 that, yeah, that, yeah. That, that you know a, a, a blog would be the best way to disseminate this work, right? Because it's like this kind of bottom up uh, from the workshop floor, right? And you just get it out there, but ultimately. The, well, this work became. There, you know, blah, right blah, now, nothing blah. is being edited and nothing yeah. is right. being curated. Which right, is right, right. right. Editors are curators of a sort, actually, yeah. in effect. That's, that's really what it is. But, you know, in 1979, blogs were not a big thing. And I mean, there was so, so, you know, there wasn't that option when all this was starting. Right. And I think that's the really fascinating difference is that what people got, whatever the source, in 1979 was curated information. Now they get uncurated information. Uh, I don't, you know, you can argue, we can argue till the end of time which is better, and obviously there's some things that are better about one, but at a huge price of losing certain things, and um, we get much more, but we lose the notion of curation in quite the same way. I, th I think the, the, the oh, I, I think that the that the other issue is, is is sort of a representation. You know what architects are spending all of their time doing, and I remember I guess 1985 or something interning at Morphosis as a student. There was maybe 20 people working on PA award submittals. You know, tw 20. You know, drafting away and drawing. You know, worm's eye axos of stuff, and that 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 was sort of the normal thing. And I, I think that's it's, it's sort of fascinating to me. You know what we as offices now are producing, like what is the way that, what, what are the kind of images, no longer a PA award, is it, is it you know, a, a rendering that kind of goes viral, is it, is it worth it to do competitions again because those have such iconic images as part of it that, that it kind of increases status. But it is, I think it becomes trickier for, um, to do the kind of explorations that say the gallery show here shows, which are very much you know unique representational explorations in terms of you know how, what might have have kind of uh, efficacy in the practice of architecture or the dissemination of one's architectural idea. So what do you? I mean, when you think for your practice, what are you thinking of then? I mean, when you when you know if 25 years ago it was PA awards, what's the what's the carrot? That, that's the, that's the, that's the question. What is it? I think it, it, I think there's so many different kind. You know, the New York Times is probably still a still the the, the biggest. Uh, you get the, the most power press, as it were. But that's that's, that's a pretty rarefied field, and they barely publish right, anything. It, 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 it doesn't like, have the power it once did either. Yeah, it does more amount amongst the establishment or kind of commissioning agents. Yeah. Yeah. But I find a, a certain loss in the loss of criticism in, in a sort of larger frame. Because every edited or the curated version had some kind of criticism, what we call criticism, part of it. And if we look about who are the critics today, I mean, there were tons of it, you know, I could from Dafuri to Darko, the European, I mean, there was so much, uh, talk about architecture when, when, let's say, in the 80s, yeah. 70s, mm -hmm. which is now just pictures. Now it's like very little written about it. There is no real debate uh, because the debate is on, it, on terms of, oh, you write your own description, you know, because we just, you can just put it online. Like who who does the content? Even Archinect, or it's it's just very uh, bits and pieces from here. There, uh, I feel that there's a total loss of criticism in the architecture world uh, happening through this sort of ultimate self-publishing or a, a, a blogism, which which goes on now. No, nothing is. I'm not saying that it should be like it was, but there, some, nothing has replaced it. Yes, especially if you look at the uh, the media or the uh, or the architecture uh, publication, the magazine in those in in the United States right now, uh, essentially kind of driven by the industry, right? It's not really uh, have the kind of a critical stance of looking at architecture work. I mean, I I find many of them are extremely boring because they just kind of print, show, tell you things that you already know. So, but, but I, think, I think that kind of brings me up to like the real question of why is it that um, 
that I mean they all fail all of the publication magazine in architecture and in design also I mean I remember when um, Chi Perman had mm -hmm. the um, ID, uh, ID yeah. magazine, which I thought was really great. It was like one of the few that kind of was an American publication, which kind of duplicated Abitari and Domus, but really talk mm -hmm. about real design, both architecture, product, product uh, design, and all of that. But it didn't survive. Right. And and I think I think going back to what you were saying is that that journalism has changed, yes. the media has changed, so the, the power of, of, of that, I mean, you just don't get enough advertising to right, pay for right. the public. Media has changed more than architecture has changed, actually, yeah. I think, mm -hmm. uh, which is ironic given where we are right now, but I think, it, yeah. I think it's actually true. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what do you do if you're, you know, so one of the themes when you read about the, the LA architecture of the 70s and 80s is, is this kind of differentiation, right? Like it's different from, East Coast is different from San Francisco. It's different, you know, that there's the kind of uh, bracketing that, that was possible. And is that possible now, or is it even desirable? I mean, what, what do you do now if you're, if you're an architect and what, what's your stance in relation to the media, right? I mean, is, it, is the media a place for where you can ha have that kind of differentiation, I mean, uh, between you and your peers and between the peer Don't, groups. And well, it was, it in, so it was interesting, like when I, you know, started out, it was kind of very hard to get published first, like to break in. But then it kind of like, okay, then the editors get, you know, then you were known and then you couldn't help it being published. And it's so when we then had the, the archetype magazine, uh, we were sitting in the, uh, on the other side and it was really, it came to, uh, it came to me that it, it was sort of like very curious that we, that when you're on the other side you need content, you need the material and it's like where can I find the new material? Right. It was like a totally the, uh, a, a reversal, like as an arch you 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 want to find the pub and they never meet. Kind of like there's this sort of gap in between, and it's it's usually the roaming reporter or some other uh, things which or you had to go outside your field to find things. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was kind of curious to me sitting in both ends that there. One is seeking the other. It's like a dating service, which they never really <laughs> meet, you know. Uh, but everything is there. I, th I think the the idea of curate, sort of curating that, in a sense, the journal, if, if the media used to sort of be the curator, you know, endowing a kind of canon or, or a moment on something that that probably that is more in the realm of actual curators now. That that in a sense, the museum or institutional sort of galleries that might show work and end up having a formidable amount of power since they are something that's somewhat, you know, neutral. It's not just the relativism of the um, of the blogosphere. But that but at the same time that it's kind of worrisome because there are very, very few curators of architecture and design. There's very few museums that actually show it. I think this year is so freaky, you know, to PST with like thirty architecture shows everywhere is is very is kind right. of overwhelming and exciting and you realize that that has never happened and never happened. And it will normally. never happen again. I'm sorry. I mean, I wish, I wish that were not the case, but in fact, it is sort of an extraordinary one-time moment in history, I think. So, you should probably make the most of it, all things <laughs> considered. But what is it, I mean, does it, I mean, we talked to, when we talked to the various architects that we interviewed and, you know, asked the same question, did any work, did you get any clients out of this? You know, out of these exhibitions or these lectures, and it was seen, for the most part, yeah. I mean, the the some people didn't or didn't remember, but I think in in a lot of cases there were direct kind of. And I guess what I'm what I'm getting at is that who, wh why would you, what's at stake in being published in that sense, right? I mean, why should you even care about whether you're published beyond a kind of immediate? I don't think I'm I'm, I'm not quite sure that when you won a PA awards, you get any client out of it. I mean, I, I think at, 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 at that, it's very different then than now. I think now being published, you get clients. Mm -hmm. But I think that in the 70s, 80s, um, being published in PA and winning, having, if you, if you, if you really think about 
all of these guys, you know, Morphosis and studio work, and I think they won more PA awards than, than they had commissioned at that time. Right. I think that's true. I think that's true. Uh, I mean, there's, but again, you have to make a distinction between the, uh, the media that speaks only within the profession and that which connects to, the, uh, addresses the outside world and not the prof profession particularly. Right. Right. I, I, don't, I don't think that there was a, a sophistication, I, don't, I wouldn't say it's an, a lack of sophistication, but I don't think that was the intention at all of, of these guys in that level of their practice. I think they were in competition with one another. I think they were looking to change the world of Los Angeles. I don't think they were looking to change the world. I know globalization is part of what you wanted to get at, but they were biting off a small part of California mm -hmm. and trying to move that physically in a, in a very different way from the previous generations. And I don't think there was any expectation that they would get work out of getting published in PA. I think it was a, a direct competition with their peers and it was uh, sort of, if you made it there, that meant something amongst that circle of people. And then it, it got to the point where not, even getting published in PA wasn't enough. It was, you had to have the cover. You had to have the cover of A plus U because everybody else was gonna be in the magazine too. Right. So, so it, it, and there was no expectation of getting work. It was truly a, uh, an internal drive to be recognized and celebrated amongst your peers that was first and foremost important. Uh, yeah, I think that's true. And, and to sh show that uh, significant and new things in architecture did not happen only on the East Coast, that they also happened here. I think that was the, the subtext of all of it. I th that, isn't that sort of like the, the, the throwback, though, then to kind of the right Schindler Neutra, like the, the idea of, of California as a, as a state of mavericks, I think, is something that was really useful for getting clients throughout that period, that clients themselves in California thought of themselves as sort of unique, maybe sort of the opposite of East Coast establishment clientele, that that, 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 that idea of, you know, wanting new images or being part of it, kind of a, the new, would actually provide a fairly big, you know, pool of clients, whether they're sort of medium income, you know, strange uh, house additions or larger projects. But, but I think that is, that is something that is, I would say, particularly unique to Los Angeles. That's probably maybe a bigger difference with San Francisco than even a stylistic set of concerns. Mm -hmm. Well, also East Coast and San Francisco architecture clients were people with money and uh, was uh, even with Schindler and Neutra, their, their things was their friends, artists, and people who had no money. But the will to produce architecture was greater than the, the, the resources they had. So a lot of things, kind of the intentionality of the projects were, were more important than actually how it's gonna turn out. Uh, and, um, I mean, yeah, we all wanted to get published, but the only, you know, wor work you can get out of being published was in Architectural Digest, and nobody wanted to be in Digest mm -hmm. because it was embarrassing on mm -hmm. one level. Uh, and uh, the, the maybe that's the difference between then and now. <laughs> but I don't know it's, what. It's happened. still embarrassing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think it's. As uh, people used to say it was the only place they got clients. Actually, that's right. I, I've heard that. Yes. Yeah. Right. And so it was like somebody told me once: you need like three, three uh, points of uh, of overlap in order to get a, a job. One is getting published. One is having uh, your mother-in-law read about you in non-related mm -hmm. activities uh, and sometimes it's just a friend giving another friend an advice. So it's very uh, circumstantial how, you know, there was not one course and publishing maybe was one uh, thing you could always show and it was one point but it was never uh, the real point. So a lot of architects including myself, we, you know, we spent a lot of time to, to get into um, progressive, the Progressive Design Awards were the only thing where you could influence actually 
your destiny a little bit with a good project because you were judged by your peers and not by other. Uh, and then always the mix of the uh, of the juries was kind of interesting, uh, and uh, so and you know today same thing with the AIA awards. But I always felt that it's kind of. Uh, sort of architects taking themselves out of the sort of larger game by by playing a sort of inside satisfactory game. So so having all just architects doing a favor to each other by giving each other awards doesn't really help the the outreach or the the exposure. But Ming, you suggested that that's different now. Is that 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 might. No, no longer be the case. Yes, I, because I because I, I I would agree that 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 you know then I think you you wanted to be published uh, because you want to be part of a larger discourse and at that time publications are more critical. So I think that the interest for all of the architect was to to you know to to have their work be part of a you know international. Commun architecture community or East Coast, West Coast. And I think that that's very, very important for the architects then. I think now, I think it's very, very different because it's all, all about self-publication, right? With the blog, the Twitter, the Facebook, all of those things, the website, you know, you have your own web. And, and, and it really is about self-promotion, about getting work. I, th I think the media has kind of changed because now everybody's relying on themselves, the architects to self-publish. So I, I, I don't think that we have that same thing anymore. And if it is a critical publication, the critical publication is more about writing and, and, um, and less about the, you know, the work itself. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because Princeton just came out with a book this year on essentially teaching architects how to be critics. Right, so it's like the writing. So they're looking at the writing of journalists, essentially. Right. You know, Huxtable and people like that. The, the, the well, Alexander Lang like book, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, and, yeah. and that. Yeah. But the target audience, my understanding is that that's architects, mm, you know, and architecture I, students, right? I mean, it's. I, I I thought it was more than that, actually. What, what was your? That, I I thought the, the the audience was. I mean, the book was written for. Uh, journalism students or people interested in writing uh, who had an, an inclination toward architecture, uh, but not mm. the desire to be professional architects. So, I mean, I think it was all, ideally all of all that, that, you know, we'll, we'll see. I mean, I, I, it, I, it's a good book. I have no idea how well it's done, which would be interesting to know if it, uh, and, and who's been buying it, I don't know. So, should we, um, I don't know if anybody, if any of you have anything else to add, because we could open it up, I guess, to if anybody has anything they want to add. I guess particularly about the present, right? I mean, what's, is this even a, I mean, is this even a useful question right now, right? The, the publishing and, yes. But if you look, for instance, one more, <laughs> if you look at the sculptural show which is coming up, I mean, if you look at that show compared with maybe some of these previous things, you wouldn't identify it as LA. I mean, all that work is, so globalized and so uh, cannot be really kind of pinpointed anymore mm -hmm. in, as a LA. Uh, oh, well, that was my origin. question about differentiation. You know, is it even yeah. useful? Is it even useful now to attempt to draw those those yeah. boundaries that were yeah. you know so much yeah. part of the conversation then? After publishing a book, um, I don't know if that's any different than being published in the New York Times. I, you know, I still think that books are incredibly valid in this day of the blogosphere. Well, I think there's, there are more books being published now about individual architecture and sort of vanity fair is like, or vanity publishing is a big portion of, uh, mm. of publishing. I mean, all these things which are done in China. I mean, I get like uh, 16 requests each month to, uh, to publish something, you know, in a, 
but you have to put in ten thousand dollars or something like that uh, to actually buy five thousand <laughs> right. books, and so it's it's like you know it's sort of an another enterprise. It has again goes back to the idea of you know you do you are the publisher you do the sort of publication yourself and. Uh, of course, there are still interesting books, but what I always find kind of really interesting that architecture can, the lack of architecture to connect with a sort of larger public uh, discussion, you know, like, you know, I don't know, I don't know if ever Johnny Carson had an architect on. I don't know, maybe more than Jimmy Kimmel, you know, it's like what is talked about in, in sort of popular terms is very little about architecture and the environment. Well, there's, definitely, there's, there's a big gap between what we now have and being on Jimmy Kimmel, I think. I mean, somehow there's, there's a large cultural gap we could, that could be, could be filled without going all the way to, to that extreme. Um, I don't think there's any architect funny enough to be on Jimmy Kimmel, actually, but um, that who knows. Uh, but you know, I, I think it it is more in the public discourse than it used to be, and uh, not necessarily always for the better, but often for the better. And uh, there's there are at least a handful of names that are known far, far beyond the profession, known to the general, that are household names today. Uh, I think a few years ago, people had heard of Frank Lloyd Wright and that was about it. You know, so I mean, I think there is a little bit more in the discourse, but um, you're right, Every, the, the monographs seem to come a mile a minute. Uh, if you've done one loft renovation, you're ready to publish a monograph, it sometimes seems. but. Um, there are still some commercially published books or books being published not as vanity things that do uh, contribute a certain amount to the discourse. How, how well they sell and how many people are interested in them, I truly don't know. Uh, it's a, an important question, but we don't know. Well, there, and there, there is the more, the sort of, let's say, 90s, was it 90s? of the wallpaper, dwell, kind right. of shelter magazine, consumer culture thing, and that, that certainly has changed, you know, has sort of turned a lot of aspects, certainly of the domestic realm, into sort of more consumer culture and sort of a status slash kind of uh, coolness points kind of thing that, that yeah. becomes pretty common, I think, in, in popular culture. I, I do always feel that 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 is something that we as architects are, are challenged by is how to to kind of go back and participate back in popular culture and right. and I was I was talking to somebody yesterday about the whole like object oriented ontology I'm like how do you how do you resell that like how do you can, is that can you do like a garage that's an object oriented ontology like something like that you could actually catch into the sort of popular parts of opinion but in general we we do as a as a as a culture seem to remain somewhat removed from most of the strains of popular culture and but that, but even think, representation but i think i think you're talking about american culture i mean this is something that we really kind of seriously because i do think that american as a country does not value architecture and design so to a certain extent it would influence the media. Uh, yeah. I mean, well, you, right. You I mean, it it becomes thing. a self-fulfilling prophecy. The media yes, doesn't want right. to do it because they don't feel there's a big enough market, but there's not a big enough market because the media doesn't do it. I mean, that, 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 there is some truth to that, and it's always been an issue. On the other hand, you know, in the years, and I, I don't believe that the entire world turned around in one instant um, when the Guggenheim and Bilbao was finished, but nevertheless, it was a sort of moment of serious architecture entering a broader cultural discourse. I mean, what I found fascinating uh, in just sort of anecdotally was hearing how many people I knew casually or socially or whatever who had nothing to do with architecture who were telling me they were changing their itinerary and they were going to Bilbao because they wanted to see this building. These were people who wouldn't, wouldn't have bothered to take the train from Paris to Chartres ever. But nevertheless, they went to Bilbao. So you know, this is this is a is a cultural shift and a way of architecture moving into the mainstream. Uh, 
whether it's entirely to the good and how that good trickles down through the profession is a valid question to ask. But nevertheless, I think we can't deny it happened. And maybe that's also the sort of new sort of architectural alignment with contemporary art. That's yes. kind of, I think that the that the fact that Art Forum is now doing articles on architecture regularly is is probably the most important thing for how sort of contemporary architecture might get disseminated because mm -hmm. of all the of all the cultural trends, the kind of amount of capital invested in the contemporary art market and its possible kind of leakage over into the world of architecture is, is probably the most likely way of the next wave of architects getting their commissions. Um, and I think that that's it's kind of exciting to watch. Like how do you, how does one uh, kind of keep that going and make it, if you think of it as a wedge, that that wedge could kind of stretch out. Mm -hmm. and I think that's right. But it's, it's a handful of architects and that was always mm -hmm. the case. There were star architects and it's, it's that thing which gets promoted to an end and, and, and it kind of uh, repeats itself in promoting only those things uh, but leaves out all the other kind of innovation which goes on because the power of star architecture is much greater than the but combined. Right, thing. right. But I now mean, we, it's true that right. it's more popular, but at yeah. the same time, it's more limiting. Yeah, it's like the, the Hollywood mentality of blockbuster. It, it very much, and, and, and that, that has pervaded the entire culture. There's no yeah. question about it. And, you know, the, the, the celebrity architect, the star architect, um, is while one could argue that it's good in that it's disseminating architecture to a broader segment of the culture, it's, there's no question it's at a very high price. We, it's not a, it's not, there's no free lunch here. We, we, pay a, we pay a dear price for it. But I want to go back for a moment to the comment I made earlier about uh, how extraordinary it was in the 70s that the LA Times would give John Dreyfus the space to do all that, because none of those people were star architects then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And architecture mattered far less in the culture then. Um, I, and when I talked about doing the Ron Davis house and, and Frank Gehry's own house and so forth in the Times and the Roland Cote house and so forth, I don't even remember having a hard sell on those things. I remember I came in and I said, I found a really interesting house by a really interesting, important young architect. I think we should publish it. And their response was fine. When, um, you know, that's very, very different today. Today, as we've said, the first response from an editor would be, "I haven't heard of it." So, the imply, the implication being, therefore, it couldn't be very good. So it's not worth our much more precious space than it once was, and so forth. So we get more locked into this um, tautology kind of. of, of mm -hmm. Uh, you have to be a celebrity to get published, and you can't become a celebrity unless you get published, and so forth. And it's it's a huge problem, absolutely. Yeah, I mean the the Holly the kind of blockbuster model. I mean, I think in that sense, Tom. I mean, Tom was talking yesterday about the film. I mean, I think less. I, I would argue that from the broader perspective, it was less the kind of you know rarefied avant-garde film and more. At that time in the 70s, people like Cassavetes or that kind of, you know, yeah. within the system, but unimaginable now, right? Theoretically, digital media and blogs and everything else are should be providing a counterweight to that because, you know, we have at the one hand far more accessibility than we've ever had before if you are not known. I mean, we, we talked earlier about self publishing and, and all that. Uh, anyone can do it now. It's it's so much easier than it uh, ever was before. But the sort of those remnants of the more established media outlets are in fact more restrictive than ever, and more closed than ever, and harder to get into than ever. I, I I think that that if if I just wanted to pick up on this because this is an yeah. interesting notion about bringing it back to contemporary architecture, yeah. right? Um, because if there are more out there, what is going to distinguish you from the other, the other one? So there is there is more pressure mm -hmm. to uh, to either be uh, unique, mm -hmm. and then the question is: is uniqueness how we are going to base and 
a decision about decision publishing. About right, the, right. The, the publication, or is, is that good work? Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how do you qualify the work right now? And I, and I, and I think it kind of goes hand in hand yeah, with. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Absolutely. It's hot, and then uh, Joe has a question too. It seems that it begs the question of relevance as well, or what constitutes relevance. I think uh, to look back at Dreyfus, I find it very interesting, um, Paul, when you talk about the ease with which you can kind of get this stuff published. I mean, yeah. Dreyfus actually caught quite a lot of flack for effectively turning his back on the corporate establishment downtown and right. paying attention to these uh, idiosyncratic unknowns on the west side and was, I think, quite instrumental in making those practices relevant, mm -hmm. not just in Los Angeles, but eventually globally. And in, as I listen to the kinds of back and forth here, it, I wonder what today constitutes relevance in, I'm not sure it's necessarily publication. I mean, then it, to get published was, kind of, was a big deal because it was sort of, I think, a little bit rare until you were in that circle, as Mark was discussing. Today, I mean, you can have yourself on the web in right, five right. minutes. It just doesn't matter. And, and the is that the, where does relevance stem from today? How does that, you know, to, for instance, to have Hawthorne write about you today versus having Dreyfus write about you in 79 is a very different uh, thing. How, I, 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 I'm not disagreeing with you. I'd love you to, you to define that a little bit more, what makes them different. I don't think nearly as many people pay attention to it. I mean, because there are so many outlets. I, I, I right. think it's, it's, it's not a question of, oh man, you know, I got that big pile of newspaper this morning and this is important and what's in it is what everybody's talking about. I right. think now, maybe you look at it, maybe you don't. And, right. and it doesn't have the kind of weight that it did. Literally and figuratively, Literally it does not have the kind of weight. Yeah, 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 yeah. One of the things that actually happened with the Dreyfus thing is he got reassigned, he became an education writer. Shortly thereafter, he was fired. Yeah, uh, although was was that, was that I, was that directly related to this? I mean, I know that he ran. I remember he ran into trouble with it. There was a campaign not only by the local community but by another writer named Sandy Kaplan. Right. He came out very much against it, and there was a very big conflict. And Kaplan won. Yes. No, I remember it actually. Now that you mention it, I do remember that. Uh, but the. Right, right, right. The LA Times also has a very troubled history about architecture critics because John Pastier had left before that under similar pressure in some ways, as I, as I remember. Um, I just wanted, I'm sorry, if I just re respond to the relevance question though. And, um, you know, I think in a way it's like a lot, most other things now, it's a kind of probabilistic model, right? It's, it's stochastic, right? I mean, you, like, relevance is what you know, it's a well, neoliberalism, basically, right? Right. Right. In the loop for digest or PA or whatever, that meant a certain thing, and now you're kind of everywhere. The question becomes, what's the genre that you're speaking to? Because so many of them have a voice. Well, that'll emerge, right? I mean, that will. I mean, that's the idea, right? I think, right? That the more, and it's quantity, right? Those kind of models only work if you've got large numbers, right? So the more you publish, the more their stuff's out there, the more the relevance, the kind of topography of relevance will reveal itself, right, in a way. I, I, I mean, that's the myth. Just right? add one time, I would say that um, there was something about the nature of publication and media dissemination of architecture 35 years ago that seemed conducive to supporting idiosyncrasy, individual personalities, et cetera. And I think, well, I wonder, actually, and I wonder what uh, all of you might think about this, that Today, given the sort of breadth of coverage of things, that the, the kind of idiosyncrasy gets lost in the noise of constant chatter, and that a different model than idiosyncrasy to set oneself apart from the rest of your competition is necessary. And I, I mean, I, would, I, would, I think I'm looking at both Barbara and Nick on this particular because they working in quite different practices, but I think both. Facing that question of like, how do you set yourself apart 
Well, I'll take a stab at that. I think from, from my perspective, the, the notion of relevance has moved well beyond the, the development of a beautiful object and is tied now to something which is much more layered and complex, whether it's focused on social issues or it's focused on environmental issues or it's focused on cultural issues. It's, it's the kind of the opposite of a universal approach to architecture. And I think you can see that in some of the architectural publications that are starting to focus more on, on a particular way of looking at architecture. And I think that's, that's the way that we approach it in our firm. That it has, to be, it has to be firing on all of these various levels and it's not just about doing what the designer thinks is the next best thing. I don't know if... if I wonder I'm, though... I'm, I'm all for idiosyncrasy, personally. I actually, I, I, I feel like the, the, more, uh, the more sort of wider dissemination of architectural images tends to lead to a, to a much more generic overall context. Like I think the globalization of kind of you know, contemporary avant-garde architecture is tends th things start to kind of look more and more similar wherever you are. So I actually think that the um, one of the inspirations from a show like this or, or Sylvia's show at the MAC are, are precisely the kind of different trajectories and idiosyncratic interests that might lead to, to kind of different kinds of architectural production. I wonder, it doesn't, I, I feel like the, the appreciation of the, of architecture as the beautiful object in certain respects dates back almost to the Heretics show. And I want to ask a specific question about, I think, a moment in globalization that the show might inaugurate or certainly had some connection to. A plus U has come up a couple of times in the last, in the last few days. And it seems to me one of the things Heretics was on the eve of was the Japanese decade, the 80s, the attention. Frankly, we've spent a lot of time talking about the relationship of Los Angeles to New York or possibly to, to Europe and Vienna. But I think in the decade maybe preceding and certainly following that show, Japan would have been the kind of architecture culture at issue. And in many respects, I think the architecture culture that celebrated Los Angeles architecture the most effectively in its publications. So I, my question would be, that seems like a moment of nascent globalization in our field, an important one, one that builds towards the Bilbao question, I think, Paul. But I, I think an important one in this context. I would also actually add that I think Barbara could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jimmy Kimmel easily. And, and Neil has a background in stand-up comedy. I think we will, in our generation, see people, see people on late-night TV. Well, also, I think that, uh, talking about or continuing on, the importance of GA was really strong mm. because it was project Forgot oriented. About GA, yes. it, it was uh, right. the project, and Futogawa came mm. personally shooting these things in a day without lights. And <laughs> it was kind of very quick, uh, and they did uh, California issues and, and stuff like that. But I think that was very important at that period yes. as a as a vehicle to get work out. Hernan, you had something. First, I wanted to thank you because it has been an entertaining Saturday morning. I was waiting on the lot. Actually, I think you guys have been having a very vivid conversation. And in many regards, I would, I would argue that I agree with some of the premises. But I think that also, like every kind of analytical discussion, I think it leaves we, we select what we want, when we choose to discuss. Because one would argue, yes, there was a certain level of criticality in publication and so on that was quite interesting at the time, but also there was a lot of crap and stupidity too. And it we seems to sometimes, and for example, global architecture, it was interesting, but there was not really criticism. It was mostly catalog of stuff. And for, and I, I started studying architecture around 85, 86, I guarantee you, um, Every global article, every GA or every A plus U for six years were exactly the same guys, number after issue after issue after issue. So there was a kind of established when you got into that circle that almost guarantee you that the machine working. So in that sense, I would, I would argue that there was, of course, we have died a lot. Uh, there was a lot of interesting going on. But I would argue that today, uh, part of the thing you have to do how us as an audience, we are willing to change and understand the mechanism how the culture and criticism operate, because I would argue that we trade a certain depth of knowledge for density of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Like if you, if you are in tune 
there is a lot of information there and it's extraordinary and in a way allows opportunity to many new ideas to disseminate in a way that at that time it was very, impo very difficult to break through those established. Yes. I, I swear, look at any A plus U and GA from 79 to 85, and you will have, out of the 15 architects, 12 were the same, month after month. And I would argue that part of the problem with that is we have to put in a larger context. The truth is newspapers don't matter and they used to matter. So right, no, ergo, I said that as I was yeah, saying earlier, they have none, so the nowhere same, near the, the power films. It's yeah. true that in one way, yes, Nick Casavetes or Scorsese or Coppola were crossing over between art and blockbuster. We don't have that that often, but at the same time, we have the Sundance Festival, we have 400 festivals all over the world, people can upload the stuff and so on. But the truth is, films don't matter as they used to as cultural vehicles. There are other mediums. So it is a larger discussion which I think is important because if not, I think that is when the nostalgia kicks in. It's when we start to think, okay, there is a certain level of purity and innocence and the God cause, and it seems like all these guys, which I find them fascinating, all of them, they're all these innocent guys doing it for the love of the game. The moment that you decide to do shows and you decide to film them and you decide to do all the things, there is a larger ambition than just doing for the love of the game. When you get into the publication system and so on. So I just want, I'm interested in the conversation in the sense because if not, it sounds like a sport conversation when you talk to people, oh, they talk the old, the old baseball time or the old basketball time. It were fucking boring and slow and so on. So today we have some kind of things that are more interesting, other ones that are not. So my sense is, I think we need to start to, for me, the, and I agree with Joe, I think this show and other ones was the beginning of what we understand today as the current media and, and discussion and so on, and the globalization. And the other thing that we forget is Japan in the 80s was what Dubai was in the 2000s. Every crazy thing was getting built there, and there yes. was a place that everybody wanted to because Japan has so much money, they know what to do it, and they would right. build full mock-ups like the way in Dubai and so on, and they crashed the same way that Dubai crashed, and most of the war that was produced was crap the same way that Dubai was done. So, in a way, part of the thing is, is always, in, in a way, there are certain things that all remain the same. So I just want to make sure that we start to understand how we change from depth versus density. I think to me it seems like a critical one, and I think it's our responsibility with the students. How we teach them how to develop a criticality when you had to you had to become the curator of that criticality which before i would argue yes it was easier because it was kind of pre-packed for you so there's interesting things about that i think we lost but there's certain things that we gain right. and i think we need to start to establish uh, and and i think we need to be very clear and start to call for it like for example blogs many of them are crap but if anybody who follow lebius boots in the last three years actually the word that lebius produced in that blog i would consider it the most important word that Lev did, even I agree. Many, the sum of his drawings. I agree. And, and it's something that it got lost in translation, but if you look and you filter, that was an extraordinary piece of architecture debate and criticism that was going on that it would never happen 30 years ago. Right. We were at the mercy of the New York Times yes, or the LA but, Times. But, but now no. you're talking about Lev Woods. And you, you know, I mean, it's, it's interesting that you say well, they were like what we call the usual suspect, right? 80 to 85, 79 to 85. But I think. By the way, they were uh, the I best one. That, I want to be clear. The, the no, guys I were mean, always the same right, because actually you, you they were the have, best architects. I mean, but you also have, I mean, I don't, you know, like the current architects or the current younger uh, architects right now, there's also a certain kind of a, a list of usual suspect too, right? And, and, and so, I mean, because ultimately it's, it's, it's also kind of a self-selected uh, group of, of, of architects. So that, that hasn't quite actually changed that much. No, that's my problem. I think there is an illusion that today we have so many information that that really changed. Actually, it hasn't. Good is good, bad is bad. It just requires a more sophisticated... It's like in music. In the 60s, you can name the 10, 12 main popular rock bands. Today, they are in the thousand. But there is great electronic music and there is crappy. I, I, I think yeah. it just requires a more patient audience or a more like broader, broader way how we filter that. Um, but at, at a time when people have shorter and shorter attention spans too, and are less inclined to do that, which is a problem. But you're, I think you're right, though. Yeah, absolutely. But that maybe is a good thing. Yeah. Uh, 
to sift through it all yourself. We're asking machines to do it now. We have bots that and, and feeds and this sort of thing that begin to uh, may do some of that editing for us, some of that discrimination. But I think that there is, uh, from my perspective, uh, a, a general, uh, I hate to sound like a uh, total curmudgeon, but lowering of the standards of, uh, and I don't even want to say standards, but the, the threshold of acceptability or awareness to the point where uh, the, the ability to make these judgments that you're asking us to make to determine what the good stuff is from the bad stuff. Uh, it, it happens now almost through the, uh, through the efforts of big data rather than through these, what had previously been these kind of gateway uh, uh, people, the editors, the, the curators, the cur critics, or whatever. And I think that we're going through a period now where we have a fascination with this possibility for anybody to do anything or discover anything or judge anything and losing the ability in a way to discriminate. But uh, just as uh, we understand that at a sort of biological level, we're only capable of knowing a certain, we can only uh, uh, see, uh, we can only tell the number seven, uh, up to seven items we can tell instantly, but anything over seven, we have to start counting them and everything. I think there is a kind of uh, uh, threshold to our ability to discriminate. And so as the, the, the there may be a flattening, there may be a, uh, uh, homogenization of effect, which is kind of what I think uh, has been talking about. Uh, we've heard little instances of, hints of here. But I think it ultimately does come back to this question of judgment and that, that, that judgment, the ability to tell good from bad and all, will probably come back in again as certain people distinguish themselves as able to make these decisions and sell other people on those decisions, or at least uh, uh, do good work there as the work that they're judging is deemed good or bad. And it'll come back around and without it being nostalgic or anything, ultimately, I, I, I think there will be a, uh, I assume optimistically, there will be an opportunity for these distinctions, these discriminations to be made again. Well, in a, in a well, I, I think... Call it that right now. I think it's happening. Right? Yeah. I think they require a different frame of mind. I personally, I like to have more of that. My natural state is always I always believe that presence is better than the past, by definition, more often than not. On, on this topic, the, I heard uh, Bezo or somebody talking about the internet and its evolution and putting it in the context of the last decade has been a matter of what are all the possibilities. The next decade. Now we know all the possibilities, how we organize them and use them, and basically bring them back local, which reinforces uh, what Wes is saying. And I'd, I'd also like to sort of answer your question about the relevance of the, or talk about the relevance mm -hmm. of the exhibition in the context of 1968 was a global revo revolution. You know, we think about it big here in the States, but it was happening everywhere, and that's been talked about in the lecture series this past year. Uh, secondly, what Nick said about the focus, um, people were looking everywhere. I was at the University of Maryland and then came here. We were looking at all this stuff, and everything was on the table. So the focus came to LA as a result of, there was something to see, in and uh, you then had uh, all of these guys came from somewhere else, East Coast schools, Berkeley, wherever. So they had all come to LA to sort of find whatever it is they were looking for. And then lastly, they are the last group, or they are part of the last group that drew. There's, I mean, there were no cell phones, there were no computers. People, they kept, you know, 10 people drawing worms by used for a month. After a while, it became about publication. You didn't sit at your desk drawing, doing a drawing for a project mm. that you weren't making that drawing for a publication. That was the point. So that became part of the thought process. Yeah. And as Mark said, they were just looking for content. It was interesting. Well, guess what? It was here. 
Well, I think that you made the interesting point that I think that there will be a sort of, there is already oversaturation on a global level. Uh, so you have to pick your own interesting things. But what it also leads to on a kind of regional and local level that, you know, I live on the west side, Barbara lives in Silver Lake. Uh, you know, it's like harder and harder to even think as, as regional as Los Angeles. Uh, I think there's a village if, uh, villageification uh, going yeah. on, yes. that there's a local yeah. Yeah. interest group talking about what's, you know, within Venice, uh, there's uh, uh, things you know what's interesting, but you don't know any longer, you know, what's going on downtown. Uh, we are separated by other ideas than, than architecture is traffic and actually being in the place. So it's like we are, we, are, we are adding on layers. One is the global layer. We can kind of maneuver in that and then the local becomes more and more important. Uh, and I think it goes yeah. back to, to maybe the physical again because you, you are overexposed on the non-physical. So it's, a, it's always a kind of up and down. And, that, and I'm doing some kind of now research about Schindler again and uh, going back to, you know, to uh, Philip Lovell who just, uh, you know, also verbatim let architects speak about houses and uh, living uh, in, uh, in a very opinionated way to a very large audience, which was the LA Times at that time. And that was... Uh, you know, in the 1920s, and when Neutra's house opened, about 5,000 people came to see it in a weekend, you know, which is unheard of today. It's, it's very... So small. we're al almost out of time, but there was one question that somebody had their hand up for a while. Except with reference to the occasional iconic building, um, I'm wondering whether maybe, at least in the States, the discipline of urban planning has possibly uh, subsumed, uh, almost eclipsed uh, architecture and its practice. Well, I, I, so I, wanted, I was actually about to make a comment about this, that, that it seems, especially with a group like this in, in a room, that, that maybe the biggest kind of crisis or opportunity in LA right now is the, is the, the next decade or two where one, it seems like the entire city will recycle itself, like the entire urban fabric is likely to get rebuilt and it's already, you know, I'd say 20% along the way in terms of the building envelopes. And I, it, it's interesting, it isn't really a big topic in architectural discourse right now and, it, and, and, and in that sense there's a certain abdication of territory and I, I do think that that's a kind of a, the, the that's maybe one of the, f the drawbacks of idiosyncrasy, even though I like it so much that the kind of urban perspective can get lost and, and also along with it the opportunity for architects to participate in that transformation. I think, I think it, if we can bring back the word relevance, which Todd brought in before, um, you know, I, I think one could make an argument that in the coming decade issues of urban planning may be more relevant in Los Angeles than uh, issues of architecture, but in fact, you know, there's always been a tension between the individual building as an object, uh, the and the issues of planning and every scale in between, um, and the fact that the, the the sense of the current crisis is more in one area than the other doesn't make the other area invalid. We just have to acknowledge that they are somewhat different pursuits. Um, I think they're all part of architecture. Uh, and I don't know that we're practicing urban planning more skillfully than we're practicing architecture. I think we're actually uh, farther along in, in architecture than we are in urban planning. And, uh, and in, in, in one sense, in more of a cultural crisis. I'm not entire, and, and it, this does, I guess, reflect on the media in that it, one might argue that the uh, urgency in criticism, therefore, is in attention to these things and attention to the macro questions of the city more than the micro questions of the building as an object. Um, I would hope that 
emphasis of one does not mean exclusion of the other, however. I mean, I think the, the great mistake is in, is in uh, viewing it as, a, as an either or proposition, because I, I do not think it ever has been, and I don't think it is now, and I don't think it ever will be or should be an either or proposition. I think also it, uh, the change maybe in the client base, like the clients mm -hmm. have also changed. Uh, sort of, uh, if you take, you know, maybe Tom Main's practice now, it's like, it's much less, the risks are somewhere else. It's not anymore in the, in the object, but it is, you know, the content and uh, is, is very conforming, but you, you are allowed to do certain, uh, certain things. Whereas when you are uh, small in, 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 at that period, the risks were both on producing, uh, having to work with a client who you know, might not go along. Uh, so I think the client base now, uh, from my perspective, has, has also changed from uh, there maybe fewer individuals or risk takers then there's a broad base of kind of consumer uh, culture uh, manifestations, and then there are the big. Uh, uh, I think the greater change in the client base is that it's harder to afford architecture today than once was before. Yeah. Um, I mean, the the, the uh, uh, what has diminished in the client base is not so much risk takers as people with medium-sized bank accounts. Now, it may well be that, in fact, the, being very rich uh, makes you less inclined to risk. And since one now must be very rich to build an architect design building in most circumstances, that in itself leads to less risk. But that, well, that's, I don't you know. Also, before, I think, before yeah. the, like, I, when I came over uh, in the 76, People were talking to me, oh, in America, architecture is a rich man's profession. And most if I looked at it closely, yeah, this, this was like people who come from wealthy households mm -hmm, and things mm -hmm. like that. And I think it was in that period that education opened up and, not, you know, maybe first time college, uh, families and things like that got integrated into architecture where you don't you cannot rely on your rich uncle to build the first house. Right, right, you had right. to have different means to, uh, to exercise in, in architecture. And so even though this thing is still going on or your connections are important, uh, I think this was one of uh, the first generations where that equation did not uh, appear. All right, I think that's a good, good place to stop then. So we'll be reconvening at 1.30, right, for the afternoon session. So in the interest of lunch, we'll end here. So I, I do want to thank